Hi, everybody. This is our midweek video as we continue to go through Colossians. I'm going to play a song for you in just a minute. It's a new one that, Lord willing, in the next few weeks, we will be learning together as a church family. Uh, very gospel-centered, as all the songs we try to sing are. So I hope that it is a blessing to you, and you can listen to it on the PowerPoint presentation in a minute, or you can check it out online. It's by City of Light. It's called What Love My God. Uh, nothing going on as far as announcements that anyone needs to know about. This is a pretty slow time of year. We're not meeting on Wednesdays. That's why I'm doing the video until we kind of have more people who can gather on Wednesdays. And this next Sunday night is a fifth Sunday night of the month. We don't have anything scheduled discipleship wise there either. So I am, with that in mind, going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint presentation. So there it is. And let me get it started. Okay. As I mentioned, there is a new song that I would like us to learn together. It's called What Love My God. So here it is. A 
All right, I hope that's a blessing to you. And again, you can check that on YouTube if you'd like to see the original version. But uh, I hope to, as I said, begin singing that together as a church family at some point. We don't want to give you too many new songs. We try to do one new one every few months and still hold to a lot of the ones that have been around for a long, long time and uh, have a good balance. So we are in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is actually the last couple of verses before Paul starts to close the letter with greetings, things like that, mentioning a lot of names. And so we will go through those in the next weeks. They have a lot of value. But this is really kind of the end of his exhortations to the Colossians and therefore us. So our completeness in Christ continues to work itself out in practical, missional ways. What I mean by missional there is the idea of thinking evangelistically so that others who are not believers can hear the gospel. And so you see there where this is in the outline. It's part of this larger section in chapter 3, verse 18, through chapter 4, verse 6. Wives and uh, instructions for relationships both inside and outside the faith. Wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters, and then an exhortation to missional prayer. That's we were where we were last week, and then this week, walk wisely to attract outsiders. Let's look at the verses together. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. All right, those are the verses, and let us look now at the questions. You still have the verses there in front of you at the top of the screen, so you can refer back to them. General questions first. What are your initial observations, thoughts, or questions about the whole passage or any specific words, phrases, or thoughts? As always, I invite you, if you would be so inclined, to pause the video right now and just look at the verses again and uh, think through them and maybe even write down some things that you have a question about or anything you notice, anything in those categories. And then letter B here, I had this last week, but I wanted to again remind you, it's again important to remember the context. Paul has urged the Colossians, because of their completeness in Christ alone, to apply all of the realities he has stressed to relationships. Then he has, in the midst of that, encouraged them, encouraged them to be diligent in missional prayer. He specifically, if you remember from the previous verses, asks them to pray for him, that he will have opportunity to share the gospel. This final exhortation continues his plea to practical outworking, particularly as it relates to unbelievers. And so as he has asked the Colossians to be in missional prayer, then these verses are about those sorts of things and the way we um, live out our completeness in Christ missionally. How would you briefly describe the passage? In the context of how we relate to others, because of our completeness in Christ alone, we are to particularly be deliberate in how we engage with unbelievers to reflect Jesus. So again, part of the larger section, husbands and wives, children, slaves and owners. Uh, in our context, obviously, that would be um, jobs, those sorts of things, or just really anytime we're in interacting with others. But then this now is going to the way we're looking toward and thinking of out outsiders is what Paul calls them, but un, unbelievers. So that's my summary statement. Let's now look at the specific verses. Verse 5, Paul says to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Who are outsiders? What is walking in wisdom toward them? And how does this relate to our completeness in Jesus? So outsiders are unbelievers there. Walking in wisdom toward them encompasses being thoughtful and deliberate in how we show Christ in the gospel and our completeness in him and in any other way in the ways we interact with them. So Paul is telling the Colossians, therefore us, as you're engaging with 
uh, interacting with any sort of contact with unbelievers be walking in wisdom toward them. Now, the wisdom is all encompassing, but I believe Paul is saying, think wisely as to how best you can think in gospel terms toward them. So be applying wisdom so that the gospel and the, the preeminence of Christ, who he is and what he's done, can get into their attention and into their hearts. Be thinking wisely about that. And then the third question there, how does this relate to our completeness in Jesus? This will present Jesus as attractive and powerful. This reflection of him points to how he is sufficient, preeminent, and he's our life, as chapter 3 has said. There's a constant intentionality to point to him. That is walking in wisdom toward outsiders as it relates to our completeness in Christ. And then I have another question there. How does it relate to what he has just said about prayer? As Paul has urged missional prayer, the outflow of that is thinking of the practicality of how to live in a gospel-shaped way toward unbelievers. Now, Paul has said, be diligent, steadfast in prayer, pray for me, but if we are praying in evangelistic, missional ways, then that's going to shape the way that we then act toward those who need to be evangelized. And so, therefore, that prayer flows into action and walking in wisdom toward outsiders. Okay, let's go on. Paul adds the necessity of making the best use of the time. How does this relate to how we engage with unbelievers and our completeness in Jesus? Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Certainly, we could apply this in general use, uh, general ways to making the best use of the time, just as far as how we don't waste opportunities that God gives us and be using our time in kingdom-oriented ways to glorify the Lord. There's one level, okay? There's on one level simple urgency to showing Jesus to unbelievers, right? That's the best use of the time because... Their time is short. Uh, we don't know when someone's going to die, and eventually Jesus is going to come. So there is just, on one level, a simple urgency. On another level, thinking wisely, as Paul has already said, about comprehensively revealing Jesus will cause us to not waste opportunities or moments or circumstances or seasons or conversations, or anything else, as we're walking in wisdom toward them, using our brains to think evangelistically and missionally, then those, those opportunities, making the best use of the time, we won't waste them. We'll think wisely and comprehensively about revealing Jesus. And so therefore, let us be living in that reality and applying these verses. Uh, and then letter C here, how does what Paul says in verse 6 stress our words and how they relate to being complete in Jesus and reflecting him toward unbelievers. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Uh, so uh, the first uh, answer there is our words are to always reflect who we are in Jesus. That's our speech being gracious. What he has done for and in us and who he is, right? It is grace-filled words, grace-filled conversation that is making the realities of Jesus, at least in the ways that we are proclaiming him, attractive to others. That others see this is what Jesus does in someone's life, how he shapes their, their words, their vocabulary. And so pointing to Jesus through grace-filled or grace-filled speech. Uh, they're grace-filled, yet also containing the truth of the gospel. And that's the idea of it being seasoned with salt, right? That there's truth in what we're saying. And that seasoning also, again, goes toward the attractiveness of showing Christ in that wise, best use of time, gracious speech. Uh, and then how does this relate to the way we engage with unbelievers? This spirit-enabled way of speaking makes Jesus and the gospel attractive and provides communication opportunities with those who need Jesus. And so think through this as far as how your speech is in relation to unbelievers and how it is connected to completeness in Christ, how it's connected to walking in wisdom toward unbelievers, how it's connected to making the best use of the time, uh, gracious and seasoned with salt, and so that you're knowing 
as you're thinking wisely through these things and relying on the Spirit, how you ought to answer each person to point them to completeness in, salvation in, all of the other things that Jesus is and does. All right, so final thoughts and application. If you have any final observations, comments, or questions, that would maybe be more personal to you as you've thought through this and watched the video. But then how do you think you can apply the truths of this passage to your life? In the last verses, as we applied everything in Colossians to the text, we saw that the magnitude of the necessity of prayer, a desire for gospel advancement, and the desire to be used of God, as Paul said he desired, should compel us. Coming out of that, the elements of our engagement with unbelievers are important to remember and apply. So as you're thinking of the magnitude of the necessity of prayer, specifically as it relates to gospel, the gospel getting into the hearts of unbelievers, as you're thinking through in prayer a desire for gospel advancement, as, as Paul has said, we didn't touch on this as much, but as you're thinking through desire to be used of God and that being compelling, all of those things overflow into what verses five and six have said, as far as the way you engage with unbelievers, walking in wisdom, making the best use of the time, and then how our speech is grace-filled and seasoned with salt so that we know how we ought to answer them, pointing them to Jesus. All right, that's it. That's all I have for the PowerPoint presentation and the study, and I hope it's a blessing to you. So let me stop the share and get back to just the video of me. All right, want to let you know of a couple of prayer requests. I've already mentioned these, but uh, just be in prayer, especially for, as you have on your bulletin, Diana Hyatt's newborn grandson, Ollie, as he's in Seattle, trying to figure out what the best plan of action is as far as when he's going to have his surgery. And Stephen and Allie is there thinking through how long to stay, just all those types of things. We're going to be praying for that. We're going to be praying for Bradley and Kennedy uh, Veal with their job needs that God would provide for them. Also for Tim Delano. Uh, you can, as you look at your bulletin, find the rest that are on the left side. And then we want to continue to be praying for all of our fishermen who are gone for the summer. Also the Salmonsons, uh, everything going on with fish prices, winding up the season, traveling, just all of those things. Uh, some of our ones who have continuing physical needs, Faith Southwell, Missy Lamb, Tom McCoy, as they have some of these lingering things that they're doing okay, but, uh, we just pray for complete healing. We want to pray for them. If there are any other needs that anyone has, please, always, you can let me know about those by uh, texting, whatever uh, would be most convenient for you. And uh, let me lead us in prayer. Father, we come to you today, and we are very, very glad that you have indeed changed our hearts, that you have forgiven us for our sins, that you've given us new hearts, and we have been given eternal life, and we've been given access to you. And I do want to pray that those glorious realities would be really compelling to the way we think toward uh, walking in wisdom toward outsiders, the way we think toward making the best use of our time and our, our speech being grace saturated and filled and seasoned with salt so that we can know how we ought to answer each person. So help us to think through those things as far as the way it relates to maybe someone, even as we're taking these things seriously, hearing and learning about Jesus so that you'll regenerate their hearts and their belief. So thank you for your text that you gave us today. We're going to pray for all the needs that are in our church family. We do pray for Ollie Hyatt, that you'll heal him, and just all of the different elements of the dynamics there that you'll provide wisdom and direction. And uh, we also pray for all of our fishermen and uh, everyone else who's gone for the summer, the Salmonsons, even uh, some who are traveling for various reasons, that you will provide grace there. Please bless all of our church family and everything that's going on. Uh, things that I might not know about, relational difficulties or physical difficulties or job circumstances or just a variety of other things. I pray for your grace there. And uh, would you have your hand of power on our church, please? May we, may we grow in numbers and in discipleship and reaching people. Thank you for the grace that you have demonstrated in the life of this church for years and year, years, and I pray that that will continue. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I uh, hope that you have a good rest of your week. I do invite you, as I have said, amen, to make tonight a night where all of our church family is praying. Please take advantage of that opportunity, and uh, I hope to see everyone Sunday. Have a good rest of your week. Bye.